Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Paul Shar, Executive Vice President and Director of Studies here at the Center for New American Security. I'm very excited for this discussion today on CNAS's recent report just launched today by Adjunct Senior Fellow Tom Sugar on Autonomy and International Stability, Confidence Building Measures for Uncrewed Systems in the Indo-Pacific. We've seen just incredible use of drones in the last several years by nations around the world, not just the United States, but China, Russia, Ukraine, and others using drones in the air and at sea, including in contested areas where interactions between drones and crewed vessels or even other drones could cause international incidents. And Tom Shugart has written a tremendous new report that outlines some of the risks that may come as we see more uncrewed vessels being introduced into these contested areas in air and maritime domains, with a particular focus on the Indo-Pacific theater between the United States and China, as well as some measures that states can take to reduce some of these risks, particularly looking at confidence building measures. So I'm very excited to introduce Tom, who's the author of this report. Tom has um, over 25 years of experience in the US Navy as a submarine officer, deploying multiple times to the Indo-Pacific region. He last worked in, uh, in his role in the Navy in the Defense Department's Office of Net Assessment and has uh, since then done extensive work focusing on maritime warfare, military innovation, and the broader military balance of power in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so welcome, Tom, and thank you for joining, and congratulations on this wonderful report. Thank you, Paul. It's great to be here. Um, well, it's great to have you. So. Uh, just to give everyone a heads up of the format, we're going to chat a little bit. I've got some questions for you, Tom, about your work, um, and we'll get to hear from you about the report. But we also have the opportunity to take audience questions. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat function. You can include them there. Or if you can, are on Twitter, you can tweet them uh, at CNAS using the hashtag CNAS2024. And we'll be looking for those questions and we'll feed them into the conversation. Uh, when you do so, please include your name and affiliation when you submit a question because we don't take anonymous questions. All right. So um, let's maybe start, Tom, with because there's a lot in this report and I want to kind of maybe unpack it for readers. Just like how would you define the problem that the report is addressing as we're seeing countries around the world increasingly use uncrewed systems? Well, I mean, as we do increasingly see countries, different countries using uncrewed systems, as you and other, a lot of other smart thinkers in the AI space and in the autonomy space have pointed out, there's a lot of risks uh, with those systems being out there doing a lot, you know, doing what they do, and particularly in the context of a high tension environment like we are seeing more and more these days between the United States and China. So as a result of that sort of assessment on the part of you and other speakers or other thinkers on this topic, there's been a lot of people that have called for the, the idea that there should be confidence building measures for uncrewed systems. I'll just call them UXVs from this point out uh, for uncrewed systems and some general ideas of, of how, what kinds of things should be in those, uh, should be in those agreements. But no one, as far as I know, has actually come up with the specific suggestions for what exactly should those confidence building measures be and how should they be implemented. And that's what I really try to attack uh, in this, in this study. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an arms control, like traditional arms control expert. Uh, I'm also not an exclusively UXV expert, but I, I hoped to, to try to bring my real world experience operating combined with my view of the large, larger view of the China US competition uh, and figure out how, how could those be used for systems in particular in this environment. Well, and that's what I think so remarkable at this report that you've written, Tom. Um, you know, you've, you've been out there, you've been at sea, um, you know, uh, uh, captaining a submarine. You've sort of been in uh, these, this type of operating environment that we're talking about here and have a sense of these challenges, the real world challenges that militaries face, the U.S. and others, when we're seeing, uh, you know, maritime vessels, aircraft operating in these kind of contested areas. So let's maybe start with this idea of confidence building measures. This is a term I think you're right. You know, people kind of throw around. We should have we should have confidence building measures for AI. I've been guilty of this. You know, written this, but uh, I think you're right. Nobody has really gone and figured out well, what would they be, and how would you implement that, which your report does. But before we get into that, just can you explain for people what is a confidence building measure? 
Well, I'll tell you what, I've learned a lot about them last the, in the time that I've been working in, on this project for sure. Uh, so a confidence building measure is an agreement, kind of operational level agreement generally uh, between somewhat adversarial nations that's something short of a treaty, that it's not, it's not necessarily legally binding. And for that reason, there oftentimes can be easier to come up with and implement uh, between, between countries, easier than a treaty would be. Uh, you don't have to get them ratified by the Senate. You don't have to go through similar mechanisms on the other side. Um, so, and, and I've also learned a lot about norms and the, and the idea that norms can form uh, in the international community, they can form between nations. And in some ways, a CBM is sort of a form of a norm as well, that we're gonna agree on norms of behavior around each other in, you know, in an operational environment. Some of the ones that may come to mind, uh, the ones that have kind of been the most well-known and probably the most successful uh, have been, for example, the US-Soviet Inksia Agreement, uh, which is went into effect during the Cold War, I believe in the late 1970s, uh, and then really was quite a big deal during the 1980s. And, and quite frankly, still is at least theoretically in effect between the US and the Russian Federation. Um, so again, not a treaty arrangement, but just sort of a let's lay down some basic rules of the road uh, for how we're going to operate around each other to, to not make anything dicier than it already is. So you mentioned INCSI, the U.S.-Soviet Incidents at Sea Agreement. Can you maybe explain a little bit about like what that was and what it aimed to accomplish and what it did? Because that is, I think, maybe just a helpful starting point for people to be able to understand the problem and maybe what we're thinking about in the space now with uncrewed systems. So you had in the late 1970s, you had uh, interactions between U.S. and Soviet uh, warships that appeared to be becoming riskier and riskier and uh, with more and more risk of collision. Uh, and with the fact that both sides were really armed to the teeth at that point uh, and, it, and, it, and it quite a great uh, level of tension between the two countries, the idea was, hey, let's, let's tone this down a little bit and let's at least come up with uh, some reasonable rules of the road that we can work with in order to have predictable interactions. And you know, if we're gonna have a war on purpose with each other, fine, let's not have war on accident, uh, because which neither side really wanted. So, and, it, and I found what was very interesting in the project was going and looking in more detail at Inksy, because I'd never really looked in detail at, at that agreement and how it worked. And it was pretty surprising to me that for the most part, that agreement built on existing kind of CBMs that were already out there in the international space in this case, COLREGS, the International Maritime Organization uh, Collision, you know, Collision for uh, or Regulations for Prevention of Collision at Sea. This is the old, so, so to speak, maritime rules of the road, uh, which we see in the headlines still to this day between the U.S. and China. So those are rule sets that have been established over, were you know, carefully developed uh, through time and error over hundreds of years, and have reached general acceptance again as a norm uh, in the international community. That was a norm then that under the INCSI agreement, the U.S. and Soviets were able to, to grab a hold of and provide the basis for most of the rules of behavior for the interactions that we would have. So it was kind of, let's all let's all follow Colregs. Let's not be jerks to each other. Let's not blanch, point, point lasers at each other and jam each other and drive through each other's formations. And let's get together once a year and talk about things that have happened. And that was, that's really kind of, was kind of surprised me how much how straightforward it was in that regard and how much it relied upon previously, previously existing rule sets. And so um, paint a picture for me of, okay, we, we have these rules of the road that already exist in many contexts today for these air and maritime encounters, whether they're a bilateral agreement like the U.S. Soviet incident to sea agreement was or multilateral like Colregs. Um, now we're seeing nations introduce uncrewed vessels with increasing amounts of autonomy in them over time and What's the risk here? Can you paint for us a picture of like what's the concern as we see these vessels or aircraft introduced? So the concern to me is that we could end up having interaction. You know, like when, when one ship encounters another ship, that's everybody's got crews on board. They know how to talk to each other. They're able to communicate. You know, the, the interactions between those vessels are generally going to be pretty predictable, unless one side has deliberately decided to not follow those rules. In general, they're going to be pretty predictable when it's crewed platforms, when aircraft encounter each other, when ships encounter each other. When you add uncrewed systems into the mix, vessels that eh, not necessarily are going to be able to communicate with you under on, on the same frequencies, and that also may not follow the same rules, or may have where, uh, cases where the rules are undefined, then now you've, now you've introduced uncertainty into the situation where you may not know how exactly another vessel is going to, going to react uh, to you, and so that may, may, that may cause 
unpredictable results in terms of those interactions. And, and especially in the case of where there's, you know, you're in a crisis situation and there's maybe maybe risks of armed action, uh, then things become, may become very unpredictable because you may not know what the rules of engagement are uh, for that uncrewed system. It may not be able to ascertain what your crewed vessel is doing, and, or you may have just uncrewed on uncrewed interactions where there's really very little uh, happening there. So they're just not well covered by existing agreements, whether we're talking the bilateral memorandum, memoranda of understanding between the U.S. and China or the multinational Q, Western Naval Symposium's Q's, the C Code for Unplanned Encounters at Sea, or quite frankly, coal regs. I mean, there's coal regs for the most part will work, but there are points of uncertainty that the International Maritime Organization has agreed do have to be addressed. Well, the thing that's always struck with me looking at this is, um, you know, we have people that are put in these situations and we've had incidents um, certainly over the years. You know, just a few years ago, we had U.S. and Russian warplanes over Syria, uh, both operating in the same airspace. And we don't want to get into a shooting war with the Russians in Syria. Um, and, you know, we can give humans kind of these this kind of guidance and rules and, and people can rely on their best judgment and then use these rule frameworks to de-conflict with other nations. But when you put out some either, you know, uh, remotely piloted aircraft. Now we're relying on that communications link. And there may not be some of those communication channels that you were describing where you could, um, you know, just go ahead and get on the radio with somebody else uh, on that on that vessel. Or as we see more automation, we're just going to rely on whatever the automation told that system to do. And sort of, you know, you're, you're increasing the opportunity for miscalculation, misperception, um, the system will do whatever you program to do, but may not be what you want in the instance. Or people just may, the other side, misinterpret what the system is doing. And um, all of that sort of increases new friction and new opportunity for miscalculation in some of these incidents. I agree. You know, and I think that part of why it would be beneficial to have coverage of uncrewed systems under these agreements and basically to expand these agreements to, to cover uncrewed systems would be to have more certainty in, in on those on those sorts of points that you have some agreement that okay you, you, we, sh we should expect that uncrewed systems may do these things but they're, we should expect they're not going to do these things and if they do now you know you're in new territory and that something unusual is happening um, so I, I think to add some more predictability to to what they're up to um, through again building on taking past examples and building on existing agreements would help to reduce that uncertainty. So talk us through that. Um, you know, you took a very comprehensive look at existing agreements. You said that there's some out there. What already exists that out there that cover the space, either multilateral or bilateral agreements between the U.S. and China? And then what were the, some of the gaps that you found that they don't address at the moment on crude systems? Well, my, my inspiration here was, again, I'm, I'm, I spent a long time in the Navy. And, and in the Navy, I generally learned that in most cases, Whatever it is you're looking at, someone else has done something like it before. So with that way of doing business in mind, I went and looked at what does success look like? You know, Inc. is generally considered to be pretty successful. There's other agreements, coal regs, you know, whatnot, prize rules that have been successful. So I went to look at what does success look like? And generally, the successful agreements, again, built on existing sets of behaviors uh, from there. So. To, to, to do that in this case, I went to go look at what are, what are the what are those existing agreements that you asked about. So in particular, we have two memorandums of understanding between the U.S. and China in that were uh, agreed to in 2014 and 2015. They look a lot like Inksy does. They, you know, they, they kind of say, let's all follow the rules, around, rules, rules of the road around each other. Let's not be jerks to each other. Let's not point lasers at each other and jam each other. Don't drive through each other's formations. Let's get together once a year and talk about things. And oh, by the way, if we need to communicate, let's let's use the standard means of doing so for crude platforms. Then you have the code for un unplanned encounters at sea. And that's again, that's a multinational uh, agreement of which the U.S. and China are both signatories. That looks kind of similar to that. It's not. It's a little more general than than the bilaterals between U.S. and China, but but pretty pretty straightforward. And then we underpinning all of that, we have coal regs, the IMOs, uh, maritime rules of the road. Now, the gaps in those agreements are, for one thing, the 2014 U.S.-China Maritime Safety MOU just excludes uncrewed warships. They're just not covered. So if you and, and that, that's an area that's of interest because you've got the U.S. Navy in particular building some pretty substantial uncrewed surface ships. 
Uh, they're going to have missile magazines on board. They are a key part of the plans of the U.S. The U.S. Navy's future. So that's a big gap. Um, then if you look at naval auxiliaries, so all the other vessels that are not um, warships, but that assist, and this could be you know, any kind of surveillance USV or a mine, mine clearing USV or um, you know, supply vessels, lots of possibilities that they're, they're not covered uh, by, or, the, or at least certainly it's quite unclear uh, whether they're covered or not. So a lot, a lot of lack of clarity. There's not, there's not really a lot of relative relevant guidance for doing such thing as blinding or interfering with uh, the operation on crude platforms. There's plenty of that about crude platforms, like don't point lasers, you know, don't eliminate the other side bridge, whatnot. But in terms of uncrewed platforms, not a lot of clarity there. Uh, in terms of the U.S. China, then in 2015, there was an aircraft supplement that actually does cover uncrewed air systems. It says it does. When we get down, drill down into the specifics of how those aircraft are supposed to interact. It isn't clear how that's supposed to work because it refers again to international rules, but those international rules, which are laid out by ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, those are currently unclear and, un, and under revision. So, so there's a bit of clarity there. Similarly, the Q's multinational agreement, again, lacks clarity as to whether these uncrewed vessels are included or not. It includes uncrewed aircraft, but again, lacks clarity in how, they, how that's applied. Uh, and certainly whether uh, both of these, all these agreements, whether undersea vessels are, are included, which are inclu increasingly important uh, platforms. And then the means of communication are not delineated for uncrewed platforms, only only for your traditional channel 16, 121.5, the, the frequencies that we would expect to use for, for those. And last, coal regs that underpins it all. The International Maritime Organization has said that while most of it will still apply, there are revisions required for things like terminology, lights, shapes, sound signals, uh, you know, when, when are you inside of another vessel if there's no people on board? Um, so mm -hmm. there's clear clarifications that need to be made to those underpinning agreements as well. So can you give us a sample? Because, I mean, one of the things that I, I just love about your report is you don't just say we should do confidence building measures. We should update these things. But you offer specific you know, guidance on language in each of these different types of existing agreements, how they should be updated. And uh, it's very comprehensive. I would encourage people to check it out on the website for the report, which is up online at the CNAS website. Um, but can you give us like a flavor of what some of those rules are that you're proposing kind of to update some of the existing agreements? So uh, let me pull up. The, I, there are some appendices that so, so that people don't have to read through all the details lot, themselves within the report. There is, you know, there is an append, there's an appendix uh, that gives actual proposed language for uh, for um, uh, for updating those agreements. Now, first, I'll, I'll address and the, the way those the way those proposed languages are break, broken down is three larger sets of options. So, one option is to is for the U.S. to just unilaterally or maybe plurilaterally with uh, uh, in combination with some other uh, with other countries. And, and and actually, there's a parallel here. I was I was pointed out to be I didn't even know this uh, that there's some res there's responsible AI usage standards that it looks like, and this was Cindy Friedberg at Defense, Breaking the Fence pointed this out in an article that he dropped today on, on this study, um, that that there are um, examples of this happening right now in the AI space. So so again, you make a unilateral declaration that, you know, yeah, these agreements don't say that, the, that they cover on crude systems, but we're going to say that as far as we're concerned, we will act like they do uh, in the interest of clarity and the interest of, of moving forward on this. So maybe do this unilaterally or maybe plurilaterally with some you know, likewise uh, like-minded nations. This is again where norms come, come to, the, to the fore. So if you get enough like-minded countries together and you just kind of say, hey, this is a norm and we're gonna do this stuff together, then you may be able to bring pressure to get further agreements so that you, you, from the Chinese side, for example, you get more help. So first, a unilateral declaration, and then second, potentially at least a, what I call a minimalist negotiated approach with China where we all we get together and basically all we say is let's all agree that we're going to we're just going to give a very basic revision to the 2014 MOU that says when we say military vessel it includes warships and naval auxiliaries whether they're crewed or not and then again another another very very minor revision that says that the, that the MOU and we're going to agree that all our uncrewed vessels and aircraft will be operated consistent with existing rule sets, coal regs and cues, as practicable pending their revision. This is a very basic agreement. Let's just agree that this stuff applies. And then lastly, further on down the line, 
a more proactive approach where we can, where we negotiate more detailed changes like frequencies that are required, like clarifications about when an uncrewed threat system is being threatened, uh, like clarifications such as blinding platforms, that kind of thing. That, so a much more detailed revision. So, uh, you know, that that's kind of the specifics that are in there. And those that's the language that is in Appendix A in the report. I'm going to draw you out a little bit more on these different options that you outline in the report, because you outline kind of, you know, the U.S. could take a unilateral approach. Obviously, it'd be better if we could reach agreement with China and you kind of offer a, a more minimalist approach to tell we could get or more detailed and fulsome one. But one of the things I'll often hear in this space of maybe AI governance more broadly as well, or just any kind of arms control, you know, China will never agree, they'll never agree to any of this stuff. That may be true. Uh, you know, we see the U.S. and China are now getting down to bilateral talks on AI. I would hope that military AI is part of the conversation, and this, um, you know, this work has the opportunity to feed into that. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about the value of either a unilateral approach or a plurilateral approach with the U.S. and like-minded countries? If we're not able to get, for example, China on board, what would be the value then of doing something unilateral? Well, I think there, there's there's a number of different ways that it can be valuable. One is just that is just to keep in mind that it, it'll be pretty low cost for us. I mean, we are already designing our uncrewed systems to follow international rules. I mean, the U.S. is not going to send autonomous surface vessels out there that don't follow already follow coal regs to the greatest extent practicable. So, so there's not a lot we're giving up there by us saying. Hey, we're going to consider that uncrewed systems are covered by the 2014, the 2014 and 2015 MOUs. Again, we're not giving up much. And and, and to be clear, every, in all of these proposals, I state that the U.S. should have. We'll, we're going to self-declare an escape clause that we can that we can suspend uh, these provisions at any time necessary. So we found in a in a tabletop exercise that we did in support of this report that when experts were put in different in, in scenarios and kind of a crisis scenario. They found that it could be good to have an escape hatch because it may actually be useful to let uncrewed systems kind of take some fire as half rungs on the escalation ladder. So we don't want to necessarily hamstring our, ourselves or the Chinese for that matter too much in terms of being able to put these systems at a bit more risk in a crisis. So there is an escape hatch in any case. In any case. So the value here, again, relatively low cost. We're going to largely program systems to operate this way anyways. Uh, and the gain for us is more certainty. So, yes, in, in one regard, uh, it'll may restrict us slightly in the way we're going to operate. But on the Chinese side, they'll have more certainty into how our systems are going to operate. So there's less likelihood in that case of even though they may not be following uh, the same rule sets, they can at least what we're doing is a little more predictable for them. And that may, that may prevent mistakes on their part, uh, which, you know, I think they're pretty nervous about some of this stuff. So um, so that could be good. Uh, then there's, again, building a kind of island of norms together with like-minded nations that can cause, because what you can do, if you have enough people latch onto this, then it's eventually you can kind of posit the people that are not part of it as sort of rogue nations, that why aren't they taking part in this clearly sensible effort uh, to make some rules to reduce uncertainty. So there, there are a number of ways that could be useful on the messaging front as well. Well, and I just think it's such a critical point that you make, that this is not some kind of arms control agreement where you're saying, well, we're not going to build something or we're taking something off the table. It's um, we're laying out rules of the road, how we intend to operate these systems. It's maybe more analogous to say, hey, we're going to drive on the right side of the road. If uh, you would like to avoid a collision, just give me the heads up. This is where we're going to be. You know, and, <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. It's, it's but and, and this is this is very much not about uh, arms control or banning lethal autonomous weapons like one of the points I make in the report is like, I think that that, that is just not going to happen. I mean, you know, we're, we're seeing, you know, more and more use of, of autonomous systems in Ukraine. I think certainly in the, in the Indo-Pacific, it's going to be really hard for either side to succeed without them. So I'd say up front, like, this is not about banning autonomous weapons. And I don't, I think this is where you go. You, you, you do these confidence building measures. So if they're going to be out there, let's at least just have, to be realist, have some realistic means of having them at least interact in a predictable manner. Well, there might be some audience members who, who like that and some who disagree with that, but uh, we'll have to shelve that one for another conversation. Um, I just want to close. Maybe it'd be great to, I want to give a shout out. You mentioned the tabletop exercise. I want to give a shout out to Jacqueline Schneider at Hoover, who um, came on board to assist us and ran, designed and ran this tabletop exercise. 
Can you give us just a couple words um, here in the last couple of minutes time about the, the key findings that jumped out at you from that exercise where we took these kind of draft confidence measures, we brought together experts from a diverse set of viewpoints, put them into some scenarios to kind of road test these a little bit. That was part of the methodology that went into the report. And what was some of your takeaways from that experience? So the first one is, and, and, and to be clear, that that, that inspired um, some ch you know, real changes to the report. So one of the first things that came out of that was that which uncrewed systems fall under CBMs is an important one. It can be, and it can be ambiguous. Um, so that inspired a whole appendix, Appendix B, uh, in their report, which does lay down some of those definitions of what what are we going to say falls under these under these under these CBMs. So, you know, for example, like your DJI quadcopter that weighs a couple of pounds, you know, do we really need to treat that in the same way that we treat uh, other, like, a, you know, a Predator or a Global Hawk or the Chinese equivalent? Oh, of course not. Um, so, and, and one of the things that came, that was suggested in the TTX was, you know, we have, there are standard means of talking about these, about these systems, uh, you know, leverage those and, and, and those, those existing standards and, and move forward that way. So that's what I, that's what I did. You know, I, I, I went and figured out what are the kind of standards uh, for air systems, vessels, et cetera, um, that we can define these. So that's that was the first thing that, that really made uh, a, a change to the report. The second is the there's a, there's a potential stability instability paradox for uncrewed systems, and they could be useful in a crisis. I talked about this already, uh, and that that definitely affected the report to some degree. In that I we put those escape I put those escape hatches in all of these uh, proposals that either side, if we're in a crisis, can say you know what we're suspending these measures. And we're back to the old old rules that only cover the crude systems. To make those uncrewed systems available as kind of tokens uh, that could be used in a crisis as a half half rung on the escalation ladder. Um, another finding was that potentially these CBMs are most useful before and after a crisis. So, and and I, I think that makes sense, right? We're, we're less likely to wind up in a crisis if these systems are operating, you know, in, in predictable ways around each other. So that you don't have a crisis start up because of uh, you know some un unintended uh, untoward incident, but in a crisis maybe not so useful. So so that's where that escape hatch again uh, comes in that escape clause for these agreements. And then lastly, that there could be unique benefits to, to the unilateral um, CBMs or plurilateral ones. And that that again informed that idea of having that op first option, which is you know what let's not wait for uh, the Chinese to come to the table. Let's just say we're going to operate in accordance with these these. Uh, uh, rules of behavior. That's great. Um, well, we are about out of time. Um, so I want to go ahead and stop there. Um, thank you, Tom, for joining us. It's just a remarkable report. You put in a tremendous amount of work on this um, and just did some really detailed and thoughtful analysis. Um, and this, so, so really appreciate the work that you've done and you've taken, I think, an, an abstract talking point uh, by lots of folks, by myself included, and, and put some meat on the bones here, which is just really impactful. Um, I want to give a special thanks to Jacqueline Schneider of Hoover for her work on the tabletop exercise, on uh, designing it and running it so we could road test some of these ideas. want to give a special thanks to Founders Pledge and Effective Spenden for their generous support of this project that has made this work possible, and we're incredibly grateful for it. Um, you can read the full report on our website. Uh, the title is Autonomy and International Stability, Confidence Building Measures for Uncrewed Systems in the Indo-Pacific. And there is also, as Tom mentioned, an article out today by Sidney Freeberg in Breaking Defense on uh, this report and set it situated in a broader context. So check out Sydney's report. And thank you, Sydney, uh, for uh, following Tom's work here. And you can find more analysis from Tom on uh, Twitter slash uh, X at tshugart3. Um, and please continue to follow Tom's work and that of other experts here at CNS. We're grateful for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.